Hi. Um, hello. This is, uh, this is an interesting talk for me. Um, for those of you that know me and have been following my Twitter, um, you know that I woke up in, um, in Genoa, Italy, this morning, <laughs> and then had to do a talk in Genoa, then flew out here and arrived just in time to do this talk. Um, if some of the things I say sound like I haven't slept a lot, <laughs> that is because I, in fact, haven't slept a lot. Um, I'm very happy to hear, be here. Um, I'm a bit overwhelmed still by Richard's talk, so um, I understand if everybody still has to process that a little bit. Um, that was great. That was super, super great. Um, I wanted to do a talk, and um, a few weeks ago, I got asked to speak here. And um, the organizers asked me to give them a title for my talk. And I'm very bad at coming up with talks in advance. So usually what I do is I write the talk right before I go on stage, uh, which means that my title doesn't always work out. Um, so I try to retrofit this title uh, into the title of the booklet. But it didn't really work. So the title of this talk is 17 Useful Lessons I Learned While Running a Completely Unorganized and Chaotic Game Studio for Almost Four Years Already That Might or Might Not Be Useful to You. <laughs> and in fact, I just realized that by now they are more than 17 lessons, but OK. Hi. Uh, I'm one half of Flambeer, Dutch independent studio. Um, my name is Rami Ismail. I do the business and development at Flambeer. Uh, that means I make video games and then also talk to people in suits. Um, I drink a lot of Coca-Cola. I'm not actually paid by Coca-Cola to hold that can that way, but I like the drink. I didn't have Coca-Cola here, so I'm going to go with very water. Um, <laughs> My colleague is a guy that is officially named John Willem, but no English-speaking person can ever pronounce that name, so we all call him JW. Uh, JW is really good at drawing things into a booklet and coming up with interesting game designs. Um, together, we've made quite a few games. Uh, we've made Super Crate Box, which was IGF nominated back in 2011. We made Radical Fishing, which eventually grew to be Ridiculous Fishing. Uh, we made Luftrausers, which is a little airplane game about shooting airplanes with airplanes. Uh, we made Gun Gods. Um, we are working on Nuclear Throne. Basically, we've made 18 games in three and a half year. Uh, that's a lot of games. And uh, it all started in a very, very strange way. So, I've been making games for as long as I can remember. I was six when we got our first computer at home. Um, it was a... And I mean, I'm, I'm young. It was a 386, I think. It had DOS. Uh, and on it was a game called Gorillas. And the way you played Gorillas was you entered a velocity and an angle, and then the one gorilla would throw an explosive banana at the other gorilla. And then the other player would take a turn and do the same thing. Most of you named it, know this game with tanks. I knew it with monkeys. Um, the thing is, the only way for me to play that game was to open QBasic. And QBasic was a programming interface, a tool, a programming language uh, that came um, on a floppy that my dad had gotten uh, from his work. So I would, every day, I would load up Gorillas, I would see the code, I'd go to the run command, I'd run it, and then play the game. And six-year-old me got really curious one day what all those letters on my screen were. So I started going through them with the arrow keys because we didn't have mouse wheels. We didn't have mice. Um, I started going through that code and suddenly I realized that the text from the main menu was right there in the code. So I did what any curious six-year-old would do and replaced the entire thing with my name. <laughs> the next time I ran the game, instead of the menu text, there was my name. And it's hard to overstate what kind of impact that had on me. Because you can change letters in a very long piece of text and then have a video game change. That was amazing to me. So 
I saw another command, and it was, it was named, I think it was RND. And somewhere else, I saw something called SIN. So I switched those, and I broke the game. Uh, <laughs> so I cried for a week until my dad got me a new floppy drive with the game. Um, and then I did the same thing, and I broke it again. <laughs> and at some point, my dad just kept 12 copies of that game in the cabinet. I never stopped doing that. I just kept doing that for as long as I can remember. Um, I worked on a lot of really terrible text adventures. One of them was really cool. Um, you got one option, which was to go north. Um, and then if you went north, you could go east or west. If you went east, you died. If you went west, you got another question. And then if you went south on that one, you died as well. And if you went north, you won. I thought it was great. Um, I was also the only one who thought it was great. But it was a game, and I kept making games, and I kept continuing, and I kept learning. Until, at some point, it was time for me to do something serious with my life. So I thought, why not go to school for this? Why not try and learn how to make video games professionally? Now, there was somebody else who did that. Um, his name was JW. And when he was 14, he got a magazine. And on that magazine was a copy of something called Game Maker. He played around with Game Maker, didn't understand it, threw the CD away, and that was it. <laughs> and then a year later, he found another copy of Game Maker, and with it came a little tutorial of a car racing game, and all you could do is move left, right, or press the space bar to klaxon. So JW took the game and replaced the klaxon sound with the sound of a cow. <laughs> so in this racing game, every time you tried to klaxon, the car would go and JW thought that was brilliant. <laughs> and JW continued to make games for the rest of his life. Now, the thing you need to realize about the way me and JW met is that we didn't like each other. In fact, it would be, it would be dishonest for me to say that we like each other now. We still don't like each other. The thing is, the way I grew up, the way I made games was very much a developer slash commercial type of game creation. I made games, I worked on them for a year and a half, I polished them, and then I sold them. JW, on the other hand, he made 300 games a year, of which 298 were absolutely terrible. But two of them were good. So when we met each other, it was 8 a.m. in the train, and I was talking about this game that I had just released. It was a commercial game, I was really proud of it. And me and four friends were sitting in the train talking about that. On the other side of the aisle was this one guy with a hoodie, and he was trying to sleep. So I kept talking. At some, at some point, the guy takes off his hoodie, he looks at me, and he says, can you please shut up? It's 8 a.m. Don't talk about video games. You know how early it is? And that's how me and JW met. <laughs> so we didn't like Shudder. I thought he was an obnoxious hipster that just made 300 shitty things a year. And he thought I was a suit that didn't really care about video games. <laughs> now, how do people like that get to start a company? Well, that's very easy. If you have two enemies, the one thing that can unite those two enemies is a bigger enemy. And we didn't like our school. So we turned our school into the enemy, and we decided to drop out. We dropped out with this game. And we only dropped out because of this game. This was a prototype JW had called Crates from Hell. He thought it was done. I thought it had potential. This is going to be the main dynamic between me and JW for the rest of our lives, I think. <laughs> um, but there was something there, and we knew it. We knew it. So we dropped out, and we started a company, and it was a huge success in that we ate this for the next three months. Uh, these are instant ramen noodles. Uh, they're great, because this was, uh, this was, they were cheap. It's like three, three meals for one euro, um, which means that for one euro a day, we could both have dinner, and then we could fight over who got lunch. Um, <laughs> and that's the way we did it. Um, but we, we both realized that we desperately needed money. Now, we weren't really good at anything. All that we were good at was making games. And we needed money, so that was a problem. So what do you do? If you know how to make games, and you really need money. 
If your answer is you make a game about fishing with machine guns, you have the same answer as we had. <laughs> we made a game called Radical Fishing. It was a flash game. It was about fishing with machine guns. And we sold it for $10,001. If you want to know about the $1, ask me later. <laughs> but we used those $10,001 to take crates from hell and turn it into Super Crate Box. Super Crate Box was our first hit. It was a freeware game, so we didn't earn any money. We continued to eat ramen noodles for a few more months. But it was a game. It was free, and it spread like wildfire. It was insane. Everybody was playing the game. It got nominated for the Independent, uh, whoa, Independent Games Festival Award, which is pretty much like the Oscars of Independent Games Festival, uh, of Independent Games. We were over the moon. We were so happy. We were getting flown like to San Francisco, and we were going to go to this award ceremony, and we got fancy food, which is great if you've been eating noodles for like three months. Uh, did everybody, like, I don't know what that is, by the way. Cheap food is always like lots of food, but if you get like chic food, it's always very little, and we were kind of disappointed by that. Anyway, uh, suddenly we were in the spotlights. Everybody cared. Everybody wanted to listen to what we were going to do next, so we were terrified, obviously, and we didn't know what to do. So for our next game, we decided to make a gangster rap hip hop based first person shooter on Venus where you try to dethrone a record labor holder who makes gangster rap with a helicopter. <laughs> that made a lot of sense to us. Um, so we made this game. Um, you will notice that shooting is a common theme in our games, um, even when you make a fishing game. Anyway, people liked that enough that they started asking us to give talks. Now, that was terrifying as well, um, because suddenly I had to think about what I was saying. Uh, but, you know, we just went and did it, because, hey, why not, right? So we started doing talks, and then this company from Texas, Austin, Texas, uh, they found us, and they said, we own an IP called Sirius Sam. Does anybody, does everybody here know Sirius Sam? Yeah? Good. Sirius Sam is this really fast shooting game where you're basically continuously running backwards while shooting at enemies, like 100 enemies coming from that way, that explode. That's basically it. Usually they shout at you as well. Um, and they said, we want you to make a game. And we were like, oh, these guys are suits. They don't care about what we make. They're not creatives. They just want to give us money, and then they want us to take Super Create Box and make it look like Serious Sam. So we wanted to say no. But then 14-year-old me, in the back of my head, went, no, 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 no. This is Serious Sam. You're going to make Serious Sam game. And I was like, but uh, they're suits. And 14 year old me was like, it's Serious Sam. <laughs> so, me and JW, we argued for a while until at some point we went, okay, you know what? Instead of saying no, we're going to pitch the dumbest idea. We're going to come up with the idea that is the like, furthest away from what anybody would ever want from a Serious Sam game. We're going to pitch that. They're going to say no. We have tried. They said no. 14-year-old me is happy, I'm happy, we get to go on with our lives. So, really fast first person shooter, what did we decide to make? A turn-based RPG. So, we sent them this idea for a turn-based RPG about Serious Sam, we got an email from them, and the email said, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> so, then we had to make a Serious Sam turn-based RPG. Um, <laughs> which we did. Uh, this is called Serious Sam, The Random Encounter. Um, and in it, you fight 100 enemies at once uh, in a turn-based system. Um, we don't know how we pulled this one off, but we're quite proud of it. Um, they were happy, we were happy, and everybody knew of Lambeer a little bit more. So then we started going to events. This, is, this photo is still one of my favorite photos from my video game career. This is the first time I was ever at PAX. Um, and those are t-shirts with my logo. That is, that just is awesome. And then having somebody buy a t-shirt with your logo from you, mind blowing. <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, we also have like little CDs with music and like other, other t-shirts and like crates with like three, that crate over there on the left, that little box, we sell that for 50 euros. And in it is every game we've made, a t-shirt, a few prints, and a few buttons. Basically, that is two and a half years of my life. And I remember picking it up for the first time and being like, wow, two and a half years of my life sure doesn't feel heavy. 
And that was kind of weird for me. Like, oh, this you can throw like my life up and down. Um, and they sell. They sell. That was amazing. Um, so we decided to start working on another game. Radical Fishing, our game about fishing with machine guns, was really popular. So we decided to make an iOS version. We reached out to a few of our friends that are really, really good at what they do, and we started working on something called iRadical Fishing. We weren't that creative with names, still aren't. Um, iRadical Fishing was going to be a mobile version of Radical Fishing for iOS platforms because suddenly the iPad was a thing. Um, so we started working on it. We worked on it for six months, and it was great. Super, super good project. Went really, really rapidly. And then a company from San Francisco decided to take Radical Fishing and release it on iOS with different graphics, which is a problem because they were done and we were not. So they released their game before us. It came out, it earned a million dollars, and we had nothing. And that was pretty depressing. Um, it's kind of like, hey, guys, we, we made that. Why, why are you buying that guy's game? Um, so we got really depressed. We didn't make games for um, eight months or something. Uh, and we tried to get over, over it. And um, the, the, the big problem was that suddenly we were that studio, right? We were the studio that got cloned. Which means that every time somebody interviewed me, they were asking about the clone and how I felt about that. Now, imagine just for a moment that every time you talk to a human being, the one thing they ask about is, hey, remember how somebody stole a million dollars from you? Yeah, how do you feel about that? <laughs> so that was eight months of my life. But the upside to that was that some of the people that interviewed us had really huge platforms. Uh, this is the New York Times. That is my face in the New York Times. Normally, I put a little black bar over JW's face, but I forgot it. Um, <laughs> And suddenly people started listening to us for that. They didn't listen to us just for games anymore. They also listened to us for criticism of things that were happening in the medium of games and us trying to make games better, us speaking out against cloning, speaking up for creativity. So people started listening to us for that as well. And as we finished Ridiculous Fishing, we started working on a new game called Lift Rousers, which was a dogfighting game. And that game was so aggressive and so angry that allowed us to get rid of a lot of the negative emotions that we had built up over time. So we released Ridiculous Fishing, and at this point, Flamber was doing really, really well again. Um, we released Ridiculous Fishing, and uh, that did pretty well. Uh, it became iOS Game of the Year. It won an Apple Design Award. It was nominated Best iOS Game, or literally Best iOS Game Ever, uh, by a number of websites. Um, yeah, wow, right? That's, that's unexpected. Um, so suddenly we had made Ridiculous Fishing, and now we were that studio. First we were that Super Crate Box studio, and then we were that Clone studio, and now we were that Ridiculous Fishing studio. Um, then we released Luther Housers, which also did really well, and then we started working on something called Nuclear Throne, which is our most recent game. It's available on Steam Early Access for $12.99. If you have $12.99, please go buy it. Uh, that was a sales pitch in the middle of a talk, by the way. Um, anyway, I want to talk to you about a bunch of things I learned over the past three and a half years uh, that weren't obvious to me when I started and are sort of obvious to me now that I'm three and a half years in. Some of these things may be really, really obvious to some of you, um, and that's fine. Uh, it'll be nice to hear that somebody else agrees with you. Um, for some of you, all of these are new, which is also fine, um, in which case it's a really good idea that you're here. Um, Either way, um, I have, I think it's 19 at this point, I have 19 things that um, I, I want to talk to you about. One, there are a lot of questions you can ask yourself um, in life. Um, and the questions I get most when somebody asks me a question is how or what? How did you do that? How did you make that game? Uh, what tools did you use to do it? Where are you based? That sort of thing. I think those questions are important. But there is one question that is more important than any other. It's sort of the Swiss army knife of life, in a way. The question is why? And it's a question 
that I would recommend you all think about really well. How many of you make video games? Just raise your hand for a moment. Have you ever asked yourself why you make video games? Do you have a good answer? It's a really important thing to have a good answer for that. Because it's the one question that will guide you through anything. It's the answer that will guide you through what you do. It is the one question that can give you an answer to pretty much any question you can ask yourself. It's, also, it's important in design, when you think about adding something or cutting something from a game. It's important in marketing, because it helps you communicate why a certain game was made or why somebody has to be interested in it. It's important for you to know why you love what you do. If you haven't answered this question for yourself that yet, ask yourself why. Ask yourself why for pretty much everything. Sometimes ask yourself, why not? But then ask yourself why you ask yourself that question instead of why. <laughs> and if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, maybe think about why you're asking yourself the question of why in the first place. Don't go further than two levels. You will go crazy. <laughs> why? is an important question. If you ask me why I make video games, it is for many of the things that have been said over and over again here today. I think games as a medium are the most exciting revolution in any medium that exists nowadays. This is the first time that we've really, really added something new to our experience of culture, interaction, all the way through. That's exciting. It allows us to place people in something that we sculpt from the beginning. Everything in a game is there for a reason. And we get to place people in that and then let them play or interact or guide them along the paths we want. I think that's exciting. That's why I make video games. Why do you make video games? Lesson two, design is communication. I have a really, really simple game I wanna, wanna play right now. I'm gonna say a word, I'm gonna point at somebody and I want them that person, to shout back at me the word they think of when I say that. OK? Ready? Sun. Go ahead. Yeah, sun. The word sun. Can you? Yeah. Moon. Somebody else. Space. Space. Somebody else. You? Stars. Somebody else? Noodles. Noodles? <laughs> Noodles. I can play this game with all of you, and it would be very rare for two people to have the same word. I've heard sky. I've heard yellow, blue, travel, holiday, orbit. Some people go nuclear fusion, which is, sure. Um, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that even though we agree that words mean certain things, we don't agree. Words are, are ambiguous. If I say platformer, how many of you imagine a 2D side-scrolling platformer? How many of you imagine a 3D platformer? How many of you a top-down platformer? There's examples of those. There was a person there that said top-down. So when you say platformer, it doesn't actually mean anything. It means a little bit, but not quite what you think. If I tell you to make a platformer, and you make a platform, and you come back to me and going, oh, no, I'm in a 2D side-scrolling one. That's a really good example of how ambiguous words are. Design is communication. It's communication amongst the team of creators of games. It's also communication towards the player. When you create something, you're trying to communicate something to the player. That's the why, again, right? Making sure that you figure out how to communicate and taking care of the ambiguity of communication is central to what design is. So always keep in mind that you're communicating and that communication is, by definition, imperfect. Lesson three, be a little less normal. Um, and this is a bit weird because you are not normal. Um, <laughs> normal is a weird thing in that it doesn't really exist anyway. It's a social construct, right? We created it to allow us to box things in, to make life easy for us. But normal, normal doesn't exist. Everybody is strange. I'm strange. 
He's strange. <laughs> You're all strange. That's fine. That's great. Because it, all means, it also means that we're all interesting, right? Everybody's interesting when you get to know them. So allow people to get to know you, right? Stand out. Make something strange, something new. Try to talk about what is strange about what you do and why you do it. Not about what you have in common. The amount of times I read a game pitch that says a unique and revolutionary game. I'm like, every game is unique and revolutionary. <laughs> or when they tell me, this is a great shooter. I'm like, if it wasn't great, why are you talking to me in the first, like, what is, what is your point? Like, this is a, this is a terrible first person shooter? Like, that's not a good pitch. Don't talk about things that are the same as everybody else. You can use them to contextualize. You can use them to say like, well, this is a first person shooter, but this and this is interesting about it. This is a first person shooter where if you don't move, time slows down. Super hot. Really, really interesting game. Uh, Polish team, I think. Um, talk about what is different about what you do, but keep in mind that there's a reason why we have certain tropes and cliches and conventions. There are reasons why we do certain things in some ways. And sometimes you might want to break and subvert them, like the Stanley Parable does. And sometimes you would be better off not to do that. I'm sure you could make a game in which jumping is not on the A button on the Xbox controller, but on the Y button. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people would hate you for it and try to punch you. <laughs> so that's not a good idea to break the mold there, unless that's intentional. Lesson four. Give more than you take. And this is a bit weird, because in economics, it's sort of agreed upon that if you take more than you lose, that's a good thing. Uh, in culture, it's usually accepted that if you give more than you take, you're doing well. I think of video games as culture. I think of it where if you give more than you take, you'll do well. I would even argue that in economics, um, if you are able to give more than you take, you're probably doing well, right? But um, video games, and especially our, our industry, is something where giving more than taking is a really, really positive thing to do. So always try and give back more than you take. You're a community here. You kind of depend on each other. So help each other out. Give back to each other. If you do something really well or you have good contacts, give them to other people. If you don't know each other here and you've been here together for three days, you should maybe go have a drink together and you know, introduce yourself. Talk about what you do. Lesson five. Honesty helps make better games. Who of you here have never, never, never lied to a friendly, a friend that is a game developer about how good their game is? <laughs> you know that that's the worst possible thing you could have done. Being honest is really, really important. The worst kind of feedback you can possibly give to anybody ever is untruthful, positive feedback. If you lie and you tell them that the game is awful, they'll try and fix it, which is great. If you lie to them and you tell them the game is good, well, it's not. They'll just keep working on it and potentially waste a lot of their time and money. So lying to make somebody feel better is the worst possible thing you can do. Now, I'm not telling you to be a jerk. I'm not telling you to play a game and be like, wow, this is the worst thing that I've ever played. <laughs> How do you even dare to get out of bed in the morning? Now, I'm asking you to be honest. If a game isn't good, figure out why it's not good and tell them. If you're not having fun, tell them why you're not having fun. If you're not feeling what they're saying, tell them why you're not feeling that. Be friendly, but honest. So here's a surprise pitching bonus round. Who of you is making video games? Raise your hand. That's a few, that's way fewer hands than I saw before. <laughs> Who's making video games? Come on, give me hands. Okay. You, there, can you pitch your video game to me in three sentences? Me? Yes. Um, three sentences. Get up. No, no, not you. The other. No, okay, well, I guess it's you now. Okay, go for it. Three sentences. What are you doing? Yeah, what, what, what is your game? If you, if, you, if you wanted to do in Spanish, that's fine as well. Okay, that was it? Good. You, was that a good pitch? Just be honest. No? No, that's fine, that happens. Uh, I, I dropped that on you, I'm sorry. Um, somebody else, who dares? Get up, pitch again. Hello, Rami, we have made a game without a name yet, 
but it's really cool. You play as a donkey and you run around crazy universes in a theater of scenery and have to like slash uh, zombies, smash dogs, burn vampires. <laughs> <laughs> never, never, ever kill cats and always, always kill robots. <laughs> Hi. Somebody else. Go for it. Um, a horror game with huge pixels to trigger imagination. A horror game with huge pixels to trigger your imagination. I like that. So, thank you for all saying no with the first pitch. That's the honesty I meant. Um, thank you for pitching, by the way. That was really brave. Um, Pitching is really hard. Getting a one or two sentence statement about your game is really hard. It's important that you do it, and it's important that you think about what your pitch is, because you have very little time to pitch your game, usually. When people ask me what ridiculous fishing is, I tell them that it's a game about fishing with machine guns. That's all. When people ask me what Lufthrauses is, I tell them that it's a dogfighting game about flying in super weapons. If people ask me what Super Crate Box is, I'd say it's a strange platformer about collecting crates and shooting random weapons. Games are complex. Trying to get across the essence or the vision of, whoa, or the vision of your game in a single sentence or two sentences is really important because that's how much time you usually get before somebody decides that they're not interested in what you do. Sometimes you'll end up talking to people that have money or you know, that can publish your game or the press. And if you have one sentence that you can tell them that will make them interested in your game, you'll have a lot more chance to get them interested in your game. So pitching is really important. If you didn't have a good pitch, or you didn't dare to pitch just now, if you were making a game but you stayed seated, or you didn't stand up, that's fine. Work on your pitch. So that the next time when somebody asks you, can you tell me what you're making? You can tell them without, uh, without silence, without having to think about it. So that if I would run into you at 2 AM, and I don't know, maybe you're slightly drunk, maybe you're very tired, and I tell you, can you pitch your game to me? You can pitch your game to me. Take business seriously. So remember that $10,001 that we got for Radical Fishing? The original bid for that was 4000 So we bluffed. We told them that somebody had given us eight. They said, well, we can, we can give you 10 we're like, somebody else gave us 10. They're like, well, what, what do you want? We're like, well, if you give us more than 10, we don't really like those other guys. So, you know, if you give us more than 10, we'll take the deal. And they said 10,001. We're like, oh, sure, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> the point is, that's $6,000 for free. If you negotiate with anybody, I have one golden rule that always works. I don't like golden rules, but this is one of them. If you haven't pissed off the other party, you're not doing it right. Okay? If somebody asks you how much money do you want, try and think how much money they would be willing to give you and multiply it by like three. <laughs> the worst negotiations I've ever done in my life was for a game about dinosaurs. It was called Dinosaur Zookeeper, an adult swim, which is part of Cartoon Network. They reached out to us and they said, we want you to make a game about dinosaurs. And we said, okay. Are you paying? And they're, yeah, how much do you want? And I said, 30 grand, $30,000. And they said, okay. <laughs> That's the worst possible response, right? They're like, yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah, well, 30 grand, yeah, sure. I'm pretty sure that the officer would say, like, I only asked for 30. What I should have done is I should have gone like, well, they're probably willing to pay 30, so how about I ask for 100? And they will go, yeah, that's, that's too much. We can't do that. And I go like, well, OK. So how much would you offer? And they're like, well, 60. And I'd be like, well, 40. And they're like, 50. And I'm like, 55. It'd be just like a movie. <laughs> but that's $15,000 because I started a higher number. That's all. It's like five emails back and forth for 15 grand. If anybody here doesn't have the time to write five emails for $15,000, you're probably very, very rich. <laughs> invest. Learn to invest. If there's an event nearby, go to it. 
Who of you are going to Gamescom? That's like seven hands. Why is nobody else going to Gamescom? No money. Does anybody know how expensive it is to go to Gamescom? It's about 300 euros total, including flight. That's from Barcelona. I checked before my talk. <laughs> it's 300 euros. Flight. Then if you can find a place to stay in Germany, that's great. If you can share a hotel with like 12 others, that's fine. If money is the problem. Um, the event itself is 45 for a business ticket, which is enough. If you go two days early, you can sit around while GDC Europe is happening and just meet up with developers that are there. 300 euros. If you don't have 300 euros, then for next year, save 300 euros to go to Gamescom. Um, it's doable, right? So if you're not going to Gamescom, I'm going to assume that you're not going because you assumed it's too expensive. Don't assume things. Check. Gamescom, about 300 euros. Game City, later in the year in Nottingham. From here, probably 400, 500 euros. If you want to go to an event in the Netherlands, it's going to probably set you back about 400 euros. If you went to the event where I was at in Genoa this morning, that would have set you back about 200 euros. You could have gone there this morning and flown back this evening. That's what I did, right? So it's possible. Um, invest in stuff like that. If you have the money, invest in it. If you don't have the money, save for it. These are really, really important opportunities that you can give yourself. And market your game. Take marketing serious. Now, the next lesson is don't take business seriously. <laughs> um, and this is an important one. Because people will tell you all sorts of things about business. The important thing in business is really, really simple. If the number of money coming in is larger than the number of money going out, you're doing well. <laughs> it's business. And like I said, I just said, take it seriously. I'm, I'm not saying don't, don't believe in business. Business is important. We like to not eat noodles, right? Um, but there's, there's levels of good you can do. And probably most of us are independent developers. Most of us are small teams or teams that are very interested in making games, aspiring developers maybe. All the time you spend on business, you're not spending on making a game. I'm one half of the company. Every moment I'm spending on business, I'm not spending on making the game. That's a problem because we're only two people. So I do the business that I need to do, but not more than that. I don't do SWOT analysis or stuff like that. I'm pretty sure they are useful in some contexts. They're not useful for me, so I don't do them. Do the business you need to do. Plan ahead, but don't plan like minuscule details. Nobody cares about those, just whatever, right? I'm a fraud, and so are you, <laughs> right? We all feel that way. If, is there anybody here who doesn't feel like they're a fraud? Good, because that's the way creators work. We all feel like we're a fraud. I feel like I'm a fraud. I'm standing here in front of all of you, and I'm not even sure why you're listening to me. Because <laughs> here's just a guy that is dumb enough to fly from Milan in the, in, from Milan in the morning and flew out yesterday night. Yeah, I made a bunch of games, but whatever, right? We all made like, a game, or we're all trying to make a game. Everybody feels like a fraud. That's fine. There's no problem there. The reason we feel like a fraud is really, really simple. We're doing a creative thing, right? There's no measurement of how good we're doing. If you have a job where you're trying to sell stuff to people, you can just look at your number, and if it's higher than the number of the other guy, you're probably doing well. If it's lower, you probably need to work harder. I make games. How do I compare my game to your game? What if you don't find money important or you earn more than me? What if you care more about design? Like what design is better? Whose music is better? How do you even measure that? You don't. There's no way to measure that. So everybody feels like a fraud. Don't worry about that. No, seriously, don't, don't worry. Oh, by the way, if you want to know about that previous thing, it's called imposter syndrome. If you have these feelings like quite regularly and it's okay to have feelings, Google imposter syndrome. Read about it. Everybody has it. Oh, oh I skipped one. Oh, that's a shame. Um, this is your biggest currency. 
uh, we have a lot of things we need to deal with, right? We have money, we have technology, we have motivation. Motivation is the most important one. Staying happy, staying motivated, or at least staying engaged with what you're making is the most important thing you can do. If you don't have money, but you have the technological skills and you have motivation, you can make a game. We made a game. We just ate noodles for three months. If you have money, but not technological skill, but you have motivation, you can hire somebody to do the technological part for you. You can have all the money and technology in the world. If you don't have the motivation, you won't be making anything. The most important thing that we have as creatives is staying motivated. It's waking up in the morning and having enough motivation to drag ourselves out of bed, sit behind the computer, and make a video game. And sometimes we're not that motivated, but we get up anyway, we make the game. Try to stay happy, healthy. Try to take care of yourself. If you can't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of others. You won't be able to take care of your game. Motivation is the most important thing we have. Ideas are really cheap. They're really cheap. Everybody has ideas. I have ideas. You have ideas. Ideas aren't worth anything. If all you have is ideas, you need to start learning to make them. Because everybody has ideas. In fact, everybody has ideas, and I'm going to prove it. So Richard before showed us a cool thing with the VR. Um, I'm going to point at somebody, pitch me an idea you have for a VR game. Uh, you in the green shirt that is like slightly looking asleep. No? <laughs> Ready asleep? No? Yeah, pitch me an idea for a VR game. Yeah. Oh, can you do it in Spanish? No sé. Es que no se me ocurre nada. No sé. I don't know. Go for it. An idea. You have, you have some time. Don't worry. <laughs> A VR game. I don't know. <laughs> no, come on. Go for it. A VR game. <laughs> we have time left, don't worry. <laughs> uh, terror game, I don't know. What, what did that mean? Uh, terror. Do a terror, a terror game with the, uh, a horror game. Or, or, a horror game. Yes. What kind of horror game? Are you in first person? I don't know. <laughs> Something. No, just keep talking. <laughs> it's a it's a horror game. What kind of horror game would you make? Would it be first person, third person? First. First person. person. Okay. What do you do in the game? Uh, Escape from something? Escape know. from something. Is it a monster? A ghost? Um, monster. Nothing? <laughs> it's nothing. You're just pretending no. to be scared. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's yes. A, in, in fact, that's a game, right? You can make a game where you're trying to run away from nothing. We made a game called Yeti Hunter where you're trying to hen hunt a Yeti that doesn't actually exist in the game. There's nothing. That's a video game idea. And Took, took a bit of time, but that was what? Five, like three minutes? We took three minutes? You had an idea in three minutes. Everybody can have an idea in like, if you give them 30 minutes, anybody can write down an idea. You can ask a random stranger on the street that has never made a video game. If you ask them enough questions, they can make a video game idea. That's why video game idea is worth absolutely nothing, because most of us have about 100 game ideas in the back of our head that we all want to make. It's when you start making them that they become something, right? Now. I sort of predicted that this would happen with this slide. So my next slide is about failure. Um, failure is good. It's great. Trying to do something and not doing it right is learning. So remember when I started making games and I made one game every year and a half? So my colleague, JW, he made 300 games a year. And 298 of them were bad. So who do you think is the better designer? It's JW. Why? 
because he made 298 mistakes more a year. <laughs> and he learned. I didn't. I learned how to polish a game, but I didn't learn how to, like, what does work and what doesn't work. It took me, in fact, to the second year of Lambeer, where I started making a game a week that I became better at game design. Because before that, I just had big ideas and I put them in a video game and then, you know, afterwards it would turn out they weren't that great. But when I started failing, I started getting better. Don't be afraid to fail. Everybody fails. Give yourself a context in which you can fail and don't be afraid to do it. Make a game a week. Most of them will be terrible. When somebody asks you to pitch something, try it. Why not? If it's a bad pitch, they can tell you why it was a bad pitch. If it's a good pitch, at least you know it works. Try and put yourself in as many situations where you can fail. Because every time you fail, you learn. And you'll learn faster than you will learn if you succeed. An industry is its people. Um, the video game industry is really, really small, by the way. Um, so take care of, you know, how you treat people. Treat people well. You don't get to get away with being a jerk in this industry for very long. Uh, good news travels fast. Bad news travels fast. Um, support each other. Community is important. Uh, but, and as Richard alluded to earlier, this industry is people. And this industry is as rich and as varied and as interesting as the people in it are. So support, please support diversity, support different people that come into the industry. You're all people with an interesting history to a beautiful country that I don't have. I'm Dutch. I can make games about water. <laughs> You're not. You can make games about different things. Make those games and support others in doing the same. This is an interesting one. Everything is a remix. Now, you know that I'm not a big proponent of cloning. Uh, <laughs> but that's not what this means. I used to think that that's what it means. I, I used to think that everything is a remix means that you take one thing, and you take another thing, and you mash them together, and that's something new. But that's not what this is about. Everything is a remix is about the fact that if you are creative, you're not creating necessarily things out of nothing. You're creating things out of everything. You are creating things out of all the knowledge you have. You're creating things out of all the experiences you've had. You've had with the D at the end. Um, everything is a remix means that the more everything you have, the better a designer you will be. The better a creator you will be. The better a creative you will be. So, go do new things. Listen to music. Read the books that Richard suggested. Go and figure out what your favorite movie director is if you don't have a favorite movie director. Go, I don't know, go skydive. I don't care. Do things that you would never do otherwise. Because the more everything you have, the better of a creative you will be. So a lot of us think of making a game as a one-way thing. We make the game. That's not quite right. The game talks to us. So when we are creating, think of your game as a, I don't know, a tree or a plant or something, something that's growing in the direction that you anticipate. But sometimes the tree goes elsewhere. You can try and force it back, but it might break. You can try and like force it in another direction, and it will break as well. Our job is to start something and then see where it grows, and then support that growth. If we, as creatives, try to make the creative process into something that is going from point A to point B, we might just as well not do it anyway. Because if we're going from here to here, we already know where here is. And here is not interesting because we already know. The creative process is going from A to question mark and then seeing where we end up. 
That's creativity. So when you're making a game and it's not quite turning out what you want it to be, that's fine. Make what it is at that point. Don't try and force a game to just be whatever the first idea was. Grow with it. The game talks to you. Don't rely on patterns. There are a lot of patterns in our industry. There are patterns to design, there are patterns to business, there are patterns to everything. They are all unreliable. Why? Because the industry changes so rapidly. Because culture changes so rapidly. Because everything in our world changes rapidly. 20 years ago, there was no internet. All of the patterns that we have based around the internet right now did not exist 20 years ago. When Richard talks about, you know, wearables, that's great. You know what people are doing at this point? Body mods. They're implanting chips into their arms, into their hands. They're using them to do interesting things with that. That's a paradigm we haven't even thought about. If we keep relying on what we know now, we're going to end up being obsolete, and nobody will care about what we're doing anymore. What we do, what we need to do, is adapt, is change along with the world, is try and make things that are relevant or interesting or new. If we rely on what is now too much, what people want to play, then we just keep making the same thing over and over again. And that's not interesting. So don't rely on those conventions too much. Again, don't just throw them away. The example with the A button and the Y button for jump still stands. Some conventions are there for a reason. But don't be afraid to break them. Don't be afraid to change them. And definitely don't build all that you have on something that you will just repeat over and over and over again. Because people tried that. You know that one of the largest flash sites in the history of games just disappeared recently? They were called Mochi Media. They were huge, but they just kept doing the same thing. And then they were gone. It doesn't matter what you build, what you do on. If you just keep doing it over and over and over again, you're going to become obsolete. Don't rely on that. Keep doing new things. The world is out there. I asked you how many of you are going to Gamescom. I ask that because, A, going to events is really, really important. B, it's a very cool perspective to go to different places. One of the reasons I travel this much, and if you check on my website, I travel, I have about one flight every three days. I spend about 4% of my year so far in airplanes, which is 120 hours, it's like a week of time in airplanes. Um, I do that because I get to talk to all of you, which is great because I learn a lot from being here. Um, I also do that because I go to different places that I've never been to. The architecture in Genoa was beautiful. This city is beautiful. I've never been here. And this is great because this just goes into my everything. And my everything will help me design better games. So the world is out there. I also mean that in terms of making video games. The world is out there. Some of you will focus on making games about Spain in Spanish. Um, that's great, that's a beautiful audience. Um, I would also like to urge you to make those games in such a way that somebody that's not from here can play them. I would like, to th I would like all of you to think of video games as a global market, as not even a global market, a global audience. There are people around the world that care about video games, and an increasing amount of people. I've been to South Africa recently, where everybody is playing video games. And I never even thought of South Africa as a place where everybody played video games. But something cool about South Africa, they skipped the computer age. They don't use computers, they all use their smartphones, because that's the point where technology became available to them. That's amazing. It's something I never thought about, something I never knew, but they're playing video games now as well. We can show the world about us, about what we want to make, about what we find interesting, about our cultural history through video games. So please do that. Please think about that. Communication, right, is imperfect. So one thing I hear a lot of people say is, I want to make the game that's in my head. Let me try and explain to you in a few simple words what I think about that. It's impossible. You can't do it. There's no such thing. But you know why? Because it's in your head. It's not a video game. There's never going to be a point that you're good enough that you can 
Create an idea for a game in your head that translates to a computer. It does not exist, nobody has ever done it, and nobody will do it. It's not even a challenge. It's impossible. If you want to take it as a challenge, go ahead, by the way. I'm fine with that. Um, but you can't, because in your head is not a computer. It doesn't function the way a computer functions. And until those things can communicate with each other perfectly, it will never work. So don't try and make the game in your head. Try to take the vision that's in your head, the idea, the direction, and make a game about that. Don't try and just copy-paste from your mind to the computer. See where things take you if you allow that to breathe around a bit, to move around a bit. Again, don't cut down the tree while it's growing. So I've been telling you a lot of things that are definitions and uh, a lot of things that I think and feel. Um, if anything I said today to you does not sound right to you, please ignore me. Because to be honest, I'm just a guy, right? I make video games. I've got years of experience, and those are my experiences. They might not apply to you. You might not agree with them. You might have better ideas. If you have better ideas, please test them. And then when it turns out you were right, please send me an email and laugh at me and tell me why you were right, because that will help me learn as well. Um, but don't define things for others. Don't ever do that. Don't define what a game is for others. Don't tell somebody that's not a video game. That's not up to you. It's up to them. Don't define gameplay for others. What is gameplay? What is not gameplay? Some people might argue that some of the games that Richard again uh, showed before are not games. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Don't define good game or bad game. Tell people about why you think something is interesting or why it's not. Don't define good tools or bad tools. I make games in Game Maker. The amount of times I hear, but Game Maker can't make games. Hell, we have four games on Steam. Game Maker can make games. Anything can make games. Twine can make games. Game Maker can make, can make games. Unity can make it. If you want to make a game in QBasic today, it will be quite impressive, but go for it. <laughs> I'm wondering how many of you are like really scared that I will ask another question to the audience. <laughs> That's also relying on patterns, right? Don't do that. Don't assume things. Don't assume things. Decide. Don't just accept things for the way they are. Don't just assume that things are the way they are. I have a question that I ask a lot of people. So imagine, right? I email the press. I email um, Kotaku or Polygon, somebody big in the press. And it's important news. And they don't send me an email back. Should I send the email again, yes or no? Yes. yes. How many of you th think no? Nobody. No? One person? More people? No? One person that says no. Uh, the answer is yes, you send it again. Why, do you send, why did you say yes? Does anybody know why the answer is yes? Sorry? Okay, uh, because you wanted him to read it. If you don't send it again, probably he won't be able to. Okay, so I send it again, and they don't write about it. Do I send it again? So when do I stop? You can go there in person, good. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good attitude. This is a better answer than I get most of the times. The problem is that most people assume that people will think you're rude when you email them four or five times. The reality is they probably just didn't read your email because they have 700 other emails. You know how a game journalist does its day? They wake up, right? They make coffee, they open Twitter, they look if anybody's talking about something and if more people are talking about that. If there's nobody writing about that, they just close Twitter again, they go to their email. They get 700 emails a day, 600 of them are terrible. They have bad subject lines, they're just like, news! I'm like, yeah, whatever. Uh, because you have 700 of them, like who cares? Uh, or they'll open an email and there's nothing in the text, it's just a PDF file of 27 megabytes that they need to download in which the news is. And they're just like, well, whatever. 
I'll not read that. Um, and then they find like three or four emails that are interesting, and they run those. They've written a few articles before that for that day that are already ready. They can probably post like six or seven articles max a day as a person. So they find like the three things that are most interesting, and they run those. If you send your news on the day that they also get news that Halo 5 is getting a super limited edition at GameSpot or something, they will run that story because that's their job, right? So send again. Don't send too often. How much is too often? I don't know. Just try. See, like, if they don't respond, that's probably not bad news. If they send you an email, please stop emailing me. <laughs> You've probably gone a bit too far. Um, but there's a big difference between deciding things and assuming things. All of you that didn't go to Gamescom that do want to go now that you know that it's only 300 euros, you were missing on a huge you were missing out on a huge opportunity because you assumed it was too expensive. Check everything. Do everything. Try everything. The best way to figure out whether something works, try it. Don't assume your game is good. Try it. Don't assume your idea is interesting. Build it. Don't assume. assume assuming things is the best way to screw everything up. Oh, yeah, sure. I have like 13 seconds left. And that works out perfectly. Lesson 20, dare to ask questions. If you meet a hero, if you meet a hero of yours or somebody that has knowledge that you would like to ask about, don't be afraid to ask questions. Seriously. We have time for two questions. After that, just punch me and okay. find me to ask me questions. Is everybody scared to ask a question? question? Small question. Can I do three if I include that one? <laughs> I'll just, whatever. I'll just keep talking. Go. I just noticed that you have the Super Meat Boy shirt, yes. which is very similar to Super Crate Box. Yes. In initial structure and number of letters and so on. Yep. Continue. We, so we noticed, we noticed that as well, because Super Meat Boy came out two days before Super Crate Box came out. We were origi originally going to launch on the same day as Super Meat Boy. We looked at the launch calendar and we're like, oh my god, they're launching this game that they've been working on for two years, everybody in the press is talking about them, and they have nine letters in common with our game. <laughs> so we delayed our game by two days and then released that. It worked out pretty well. But. Okay, I don't count that question as a question, though. That's just... <laughs> All right, go for it about your, your game, one of your first games about going north and any, any, any way that you go, you die. Yeah. You were a really Game of Thrones visionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I'm still trying to get, I'm still trying to get licensing fees from, from George R. R. Martin, but he's That's not all. paying me money. And it was amazing, amazing presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's still not a question though, so if you just keep doing this, <laughs> well, we have to go for hours. Just don't put a question mark at the end of your question. So, so be, before, before launching uh, Super Crate Boss, you didn't really get any press? Super Crate Boss? With Super Crate Boss, you, before Crate Boss, you did, weren't really known as a, as a studio. Yeah. So as a new studio, a new indie studio, and with a free game, a free yeah. web game that maybe people really don't notice, how did, did you get noticed? By press, by indie games, etc.? So, the way we ended up getting noticed by press is actually really, really funny. Um, we went to GDC Europe, and we met a guy called Mike Rose, uh, who is a journalist. And uh, we, showed, we showed him a bunch of work, and then he realized that he had played some of JW's games before. And then we started talking. Um, but we met a bunch of other people at the press. Uh, we met somebody from Kotaku that ended up writing about the game. Basically, we just met people and they wrote about the game. I think that's why events are so important, because somebody sending you an email is just a person sending you an email. Somebody that you've met sending you an email is more, more special, right? It's like people pay more attention to that. So it's one of the reasons I keep saying events are important, because if we hadn't gone to GDC Europe, we might not have been noticed. Um, the one thing I want to like really, really emphasize is the only way to get press attention for your game is to go after them. Like, don't assume that they will find your game. Go to them, talk to them, find them on Twitter, on um, email them. I don't care. Like, be on Twitter, by the way. If you're not on Twitter, be on Twitter. Um, 
follow me. I'll put the Twitter account up later. But uh, have Twitter. If you can't follow me right now because you don't have Twitter, make a Twitter account and follow me. <laughs> um, one more. Last really quick. Oh, no, wait. Really long question. Yeah. <laughs> There's, I, I see two hands. Oh, yeah, go. Is it on? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, it, so. it's, it may be a long question. It's about uh, how do we get, um, what do you think of uh, what could be a good way of getting more people making games that don't make games as the, the regular profile of the people who make games would be like a certain type of male uh, of a certain age. So, you know, I'd like to see games made by really old people or by really young people or, or women or, you know, aliens. Uh, I would like to see a game by an alien. That would be awesome. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so the, the good news is we're making some progress, right? Um, if we look at the games industry now and we compare it to what it was 10 years ago, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, there's still a long way to go. Um, and this is something that I talk about a lot on Twitter and Facebook, um, often resulting in 400 common Facebook arguments. Um, I think the best thing we can do is to be welcoming and open and supportive and to realize just how lucky we are to fit, for many of us anyway, how lucky we are that we fit the stereotype of the games industry and to use that to welcome others to it. Because we are like, I am, I am a half Arab Dutch male. Um, I'm heterosexual, I am cisgendered, I identify as man, and I am uh, born as male. Um, I have a lot of things that make my life easy. And recognizing that and recognizing how that affected my opportunities in this game industry is really, really important. And I didn't used to be one of the people that understood this. Like, I used to be somebody that would say, well, you just, you know, just judge everybody by how good they are. And that's like, well, that sounds reasonable. The problem is that if you're me and really good at what you do, or somebody from a minority and really good at what you do, then chances are that I will get the job, right? Uh, recognizing that was really, really important. I have, a, I, have a sim I, have a, I have a simple riddle that I ask of people, um, and it's specifically about one of these issues. A man and his son are in a car, and they're driving through the night, and they get to a train crossing, right? They try to cross it, and the train hits the car. The car flips 10, 20 times, and the father dies immediately. Now, the son, the son is loaded into an ambulance and raised to the hospital. And in the hospital, put on a broncar and driven into the surgery room. And the surgeon walks in and looks at the kid and says, I can't operate on this child because this child is my son. How is that possible? Who? A gay couple? Sorry, what? The surgeon is a woman. That's the answer. It was his mother. Surgeons can be female. <laughs> I see a lot of faces going, oh. <laughs> That is what I'm talking about. <laughs> if, you're making, if you're making video games, make a photo of this link. We collected a whole lot of free tools and free things that you can use to make making games easier. Um, we compiled it there. We will keep updating it. Please take a photo. Remember it. I will tweet it after this show. Make games. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle, JW's Twitter handle, Vlamber's Twitter handle. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I will tweet this right after I get back to my seat. Thank you so much.
<laughs> the two big surprises at the last minute. Thank you very much. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for your trust, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Much. And I was remembering uh, writing you when you said about the journalist. Yeah. Keeping keeping writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. That was me. Hey. Was really fine, Thank you so much. Really hey. Hey. Thanks so much. Hey, you're probably back. Yeah, yeah, I do that. Thank you. Uh, uh, you said, uh, don't assume things, so I'm assuming you want to say no. So, uh, will you play my game if I send it to you? Yes. Okay. Yes, nice. absolutely. I, I love to play video games. Okay. So. I